to Wonders and Miracles podcast, where we celebrate miraculous moments in everyday lives. I'm Liza Lawrence. I'm glad to have you join me as we celebrate wonders and miracles together. All right. Well, I am honored and excited today to have Jody Brown on the show. Jody is an author. She's from Utah. And when she was just 32 years old, she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. I've read her book. Her book is amazing. She's written a book called The Sun Still Shines. I am so excited to have her share her story. So Jody, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Kind of outline what happened and the miracles that you've seen through your experiences and journey. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Everyone asks, where does it start? Well, there is not always an easy answer to that because where it started, I can't say exactly where it started. What I can tell you is where it started for me. And where it started for me was when I was out jogging with some girlfriends and realized I was having a really, really hard time focusing on keeping one foot in front of the other. And that just seemed like such a strange thing to me that I was dizzy so much that I couldn't even focus on the road in front of me. So what that likely meant is that there were already things long before that that were going on in my brain but that I was not aware of it until these symptoms started to show up. So the very first symptom was dizzy spells. And at one point in time, I did visit the doctor for those dizzy spells and said, here's how I'm feeling. And here's all the stuff that's going on. My friend had had an inner ear infection. That sounds very much like the things that I'm going through. Do you think it could be an inner ear infection? And to the doctor, it sounded very legitimate as well. There weren't other outward signs that it was anything different. And so we both kind of accepted that and just said, let's give you some time and we'll, we'll move on. I didn't really know something big was wrong until symptoms started accumulating one on top of the other. So the dizzy spells didn't go away. And in addition to the dizzy spells, I started getting terrible, terrible headaches. So I went back to the doctor again and said, oh, I'm having these terrible headaches. And he looked at me and said, you work full time, you have four children, you volunteer in the community, you're in the PTA, you do all of these things, you are probably stressed and you are probably experiencing tension migraines. That sounded absolutely like a possibility. So we treated it as though I was experiencing tension migraines and again, kind of went on. It really didn't hit anyone that there was something bigger going on for several months. And it was probably eight months after I started experiencing the dizzy spells before my husband was actually the one who came home from work one day and he said, how are you doing today? And I just, I don't know what's going on, but I am not doing well. And he looked at me and responded, something is wrong with you. And my initial shock was one of, yikes, That's not a very nice thing to say. And it kind of hit me hard. Then I realized what he was saying was something is wrong and we need to figure it out. We need to keep looking for answers. I know you've been to the doctor over and over again, but there's still something going on. And so we went back to the doctor, did all sorts of tests. And at that time, I was having not only the dizzy spells and the headaches, but also severe bouts of vertigo. And some people say, well, isn't vertigo the same thing as dizzy spells? Well, with dizzy spells, you're the one that feels like, oh, I'm dizzy. Vertigo, it actually looks like the world is spinning around you. It's very disconcerting. And I also started to experience ringing in my ears. When I did go into the doctor's office, they called and said, hey, good news. You know, we got your blood test back and everything looks fine. My husband and I both knew everything is not fine. There is something bigger going on. So I told the nurse on the phone, I said, there is something wrong. And I need you to ask the doctor, what is the next step so that we can figure it out? And she came back on the phone a few minutes later and said, the next step is an MRI of your brain. They had actually scheduled the MRI for me. And it was supposed to be for three weeks later. But that particular day, I was bad enough that I couldn't walk down the hall. I was so dizzy and so sick and everything was spinning so much that I couldn't get from my office into my bedroom without crawling on my hands and knees. Mm -hmm. So after I got off the phone with the doctor's office, I picked up the phone and I called the hospital and I told them, I said, I have an MRI scheduled, but it's not for three weeks. And I said, and something is wrong and I cannot wait three weeks. 
thankfully, the tech on the other end of the phone just said, well, if you can be here at six o'clock tomorrow morning, I will work you in before we start with any other patient. Wow. What a blessing. What a little tiny miracle that ended up being because instead of waiting three more weeks, I was in in 14 hours. And so I got up the next morning. I still didn't believe we were going to find something big. So I thought it was going to be just one of the steps of eliminating the potential diagnoses. I went by myself to the hospital. My husband stayed home with the kids and I thought I would just be going and having this test done and then coming home. And that didn't turn out to be exactly the case because I was the first patient of the day. The radiologist was looking at my scans live as they were coming in. So before I even left the locker room, they had realized that there was something going on and they chased me down and invited me to come back in. And the tech said, the radiologist thinks he sees something, not sure what it is, but it looks like there's a spot on your brain. Would you be willing to get back in? We'll put some contrast dye in your veins, give you an IV, and we'll do this again so he can get a better look. I went back in the waiting room. They went to the next patient and then they cycled me right back in. And the whole time I just kept thinking, a spot on my brain, a spot on my brain. What does that mean? But then my next reaction was honestly pretty positive. I thought, well, of course they found something. That makes perfect sense. I knew that something was going on. All of these things have been happening. Now we can figure it out and I can move on with my life. We can fix it and it can get better and I can go back to normal. And that was the thought process I was going through during the next 40 minutes in the MRI machine was I was really trying to stay pretty positive in thinking about it. But as I was getting out of the MRI machine, the tech leaned down, you know, unhooked all of the restraints that were hooking my head down. And as I got up, she actually put her arms around me and gave me a hug and said, there is definitely something there. Go home and call your doctor immediately and good luck to you. And that was the first real indication that this was not just a little thing that was going to be quick and easy to bounce back from, but that it was going to be a bigger deal than I probably thought. Mm. I think hearing that news in that sort of way alone, was that hard for you? You know, I walked out of there and into the bright lights of the hospital hallways where people are just coming and going. And I felt kind of frozen. Like everyone else was still moving and life was still going on. And yet I had this big weight that was set on my shoulders and I didn't know how to process it. And at that time, I only had known one other person who'd had a brain tumor and he had passed away. So I didn't really know what to think other than that little piece of history that I had. And that was a little bit of a scary thing. They didn't call it a brain tumor at that point in time. They just said a mass and that I needed to talk to my doctor. So what I did know was I need to hurry and get answers. Like I, I can't have this whole not knowing thing very long. So I did go home as quickly as I could. My husband popped his head out into the garage when he heard me come in and he's like, that took way longer than I thought. I thought you'd be home a long time ago. And yeah, what am I supposed to tell him? I told him the only thing I knew, which was that there was a spot on my brain. And as an engineer, he went immediately to okay, fix it, fix it. What do we do? Yeah. What do we do? What's the next step? Who do we call? What, what doctor? Da, 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 da. And I said, I don't know. I don't know anything. So that was a long day of waiting. And it was several hours before my doctor finally had been able to talk to the radiologist. When my doctor called, he gave me the news over a phone and said, no, I'm sorry. I, I don't even know what to say, Mrs. Brown, but it appears that there's a mass or a tumor between your right auditory canal and your brainstem. They said, you will have a neurosurgeon appointment on Monday. This was a Friday afternoon of Easter weekend. So it was a holiday weekend when I clarified and said, wait a minute, you mean like mm. two, three days from now? Yeah. We talked to the neurosurgeon. We explained the situation. He cleared his schedule and he can see you Monday at 8 a.m. And immediately I thought, you explained the situation and he cleared his calendar. There's something I don't know here. That's a big <laughs> deal. That's a big deal. And you understand some level of complexity that I have not yet been privy to. So it was very, very overwhelming. We tried to figure out what are we going to tell the kids? How are we going to proceed? We don't have any answers. We don't know what's going to happen. 
but we also didn't want to scare our children. We didn't want to stop our lives. We didn't want to say the wrong things. We wanted to be hopeful. We wanted to be prayerful. And how old were your children at this time? My youngest was about to turn two and my oldest was about to turn 10. So I had two that ended up having birthdays within days of when all of this was happening, which also, it sounds like a silly thing, but that complicates things too, because amidst all of the craziness, we wanted to be able to do the normal things and celebrate the family and have birthday parties. So my oldest was 10 and then seven, four, and then almost two. So it, it was a very tricky time for my young family. Yeah. So I knew immediately that I couldn't, do it on my own. And as soon as my mom got the phone call that something was going on, she immediately said, well, I'll come up and I'll help. My parents at that time actually lived thousands of miles away. They lived in Hawaii, but she happened to have been there for an event for a different family member. So she was in town and she drove up on Sunday and moved into my house and started taking care of everything. And you talk about one of the little miracles the fact that she was there and that she just cleared her schedule and came and said, I'll stay as long as it takes. And of course, we had no idea at that time what that meant. We thought maybe she would be there for a few days or a few weeks. And that didn't end up being the case either. She ended up being there for several months that she lived there. So what a beautiful blessing that gave the kids some sense of normalcy in going along. Yeah. That's a gift that she was able to do that for you. I was touched so much in the book, how your family, especially your father, how, and your mother, but how they were so present in this whole experience with you. I thought it was beautiful. And that has been one of the biggest lessons I have learned through all of this is, you know, I was in my thirties, now I'm in my forties, and yet my parents are still incredibly present. What a great thing to see that they take their role as parents, not just as a job, like, okay, you're 18, you're out the door, we're done with you. But they really have it in their hearts that they truly do want the best and they want to help in whatever way is possible. And they did leave their own lives to show up and be there for me and my family. At the time, we didn't have any idea what the long term was going to be. We didn't know how long they were going to end up being there, but we sure did end up needing their help. Because when I did meet with the neurosurgeon that next week, he gave me some very grim news. Mrs. Brown, in the brain, it's all about location, location, location. I'm sorry, but your tumor is in a very bad location. What do you do with news like that? You know, your world starts to crumble and fall apart around you. And my husband looked at him and said, well, well, what do we do? He said, you know, I'm sorry, but I wouldn't touch you with a 10-foot pole. Did you really just say that? Did that just come out of your mouth? I'm not just a patient. I'm not just a body sitting in this chair. I'm a mom and I'm a wife and I'm a sister and I'm a daughter. And what does this mean for all of the people in my world if you won't touch me and if you aren't providing any answers? So it was a pretty devastating moment. And I remember walking out of that doctor's office and into the hall of the hospital and just breaking down into my husband's arms and just sobbing, hugely overwhelming situation. That was when I went home and started realizing this is a life changer. And one of my first thoughts went to some kids I work with in our church congregation. I had the responsibility for working with the 12 to 18 year old girls. I knew that before news started to get out in the neighborhood, that my girls needed to hear it from me. I didn't want them finding out through the grapevine or through anyone else. So I invited them all to come to my home that evening. And at eight o'clock, I probably had 24 girls show up at my house. And really, it was the first time I talked to anyone about it. It was the first time that I looked face to face to others and said, here's what's going on. And I looked at these girls and I said, I need you to help make a miracle for me. I need you. I need your prayers. I need your fasting. I need your thoughts and positive energy. And one of the most amazing things happened. And it just like that, it was as though roles changed. And it mm. went from me being the leader to them kind of stepping up, putting their arms around me, giving me these hugs, whispering hope 
and blessings and prayers into my ears, giving me some of their strength. What a powerful and beautiful moment to see these girls and to recognize they have this strength within them and they have this faith within them. And when given an opportunity to exercise that, they wanted to, and they could, and they would. And that was the start of number one, my neighborhood and my congregation finding out. But it was also the start of this pack of angels who were on my side, who checked in on me and called and came by the house. And they were giving me their prayers and their fasting and their strength to make a miracle for me. And I know that to this day, several of them still very clearly remember what that was like. And they still recognize that we did have miracles and they were part of those miracles. And they were part of petitioning God on my behalf and that that worked, that those petitions made over and over again in daily prayers and in fasting and in doing little kindnesses and acts of service, that those things mattered. And the accumulation effect of all of these people doing all of these little things, doing their part made a difference. And if, if there's one thing you could tell the young people of today, it's that those little things that they do really can make a difference. You really can be an angel for someone. You really can be the means of helping someone else have a miracle. You can be the means of helping save someone else's life. I'm not saying that in a a trite way. I'm saying you really can as you find the things that you can contribute to someone who is in need. And what a powerful message that is that we need more to hear, I think. I agree. And I think that the fact that you could invite these girls to be a part of that was probably very, very formative in the rest of their life and how they view God and their strength and their abilities. I think it was probably really a powerful experience for them, it sounds like, in changing their life too. Well, I hope that it was. They will forever be my little miracle makers. So as the one doctor had really given us not a lot of hope, we started going to different doctors and trying to figure out, okay, well, surely there's someone out there who can do something. If not this person, then who else? We went from doctor to doctor to try and find resources. And my husband truly is a fixer. He wants to find the answer and he wants to find the solution. So he started researching. My family in the meantime also sent out their resources to help me. They made a call to the people in their network. My parents have an incredibly large network and it was through a network person that we ended up getting some answers that helped us keep going. Because as word did start to get out, one of my husband's co-workers came up to him one day at work and she said to him, you know, I've heard about what's going on and, and I'm so sorry that you and your wife and your family are facing this, but I want you to know that my husband and I, like, we're best friends with this neurosurgeon and he's an incredible neurosurgeon. He's one of the tops in the world. Well, you know, she said that, but my husband was just saying, okay, okay, great, thanks. So she said, you know, you don't have to do this if you don't want, but I called him and I asked if he'd be willing to see your wife. And he said that if she comes in on Friday during his lunch hour, he'll fit her into his schedule. So my husband nodded his head and took down the information. Thank you. Thank you. And, and called me and said, let's put this on the calendar and let's go in. Well, we went to that doctor's office a few days later. And in the meantime, had been to multiple other doctors and had been told not just by the doctors, but by an entire healthcare system in our state, that there was nothing that they could do for us. So we showed up at this neurosurgeon's office on Friday at noon during the lunch break. And this gentleman was looking at my MRIs over and over again. And you could see the thoughts going on in his mind. And he turned to us and he said, I think I can do this. Mm. He just turned my inoperable diagnose into an operable diagnosis, just like that. And when we were there, we found out that normally it takes about four months to get into an appointment with him. But because a friend intervened on our behalf, we were there in two days. That's a miracle. Two days. Yeah. That is a miracle. There's no coincidence about it. It was a miracle. And 
it did turn out that this neurosurgeon is truly one of the best in the world. That's not just something that she was saying. He ended up being the chair or the president of the neurosurgeons of America, <laughs> you know, something like that. He really, really is that good. And he was brought to our state because the Huntsman Cancer Center gave him grant money to be able to try experimental procedures on the brain. And guess who one of the first people who benefited from that it was me because he had had the experience in trying to operate the, on these parts of the brain that other people were saying no to. So this was heaven sent. We were with him for about an hour and he turned to us and said, I think we need to start going immediately on this. And my husband kind of said, all right, well, we'll look at our calendar. We'll see when we can get her back in. And, and the doctor said, no, 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 you're not understanding me. I'm admitting Jody to the hospital now. She's not leaving. She's going to stay. I want you to go home and get her stuff. And I'm going to start on the tests now. Did not see that coming. But again, what a great thing that he saw that we needed the help and we needed it quickly and that he knew what to do to make that happen. So by the time my husband came back several hours later, with some clothes and brought the kids to say hi because we hadn't known that mommy wasn't going to come home and that she was staying in the hospital. I had already undergone dozens and dozens of tests. And the plan made from that point on was that they were going to do one brain surgery. And then I would spend six days in the hospital recovering and that hopefully that would be it. So we started working toward that point. I got to the point where I was uh, the night before surgery, like facing my mortality and realizing that in a few hours, I would be getting up to go to the hospital for them to cut open my brain <laughs> and see if they could save my life. So the next morning we got up and went to the hospital and my dad was trying to fly in from Hawaii to be there for my surgery. It was probably only eight o'clock in the morning, but by then I'd already been checked in, gone through dozens of more tests, and they'd established benchmarks of where I was. And I had the IV in me, and I was waiting just to be put under. My husband kept looking out the window. We were just hoping and praying that my dad would arrive and that we would be able to see him. And probably 15 minutes before they said that they were going to put me under, Tolan, my husband, looked out and he said, oh, there's Vaughn. He's here. And he got there and walked in my room a few minutes later, as soon as he walked in the room, well, hiya, Joe, <laughs> and walked over to my bed and threw his arms around me and gave me a big hug. There was this huge sense of relief. When he walked in, he walked in with such positivity, with faith and with strength. It was exactly what we needed in that moment. And once I knew that my family was there, then I truly could like step back and know that it was all in God's hands and that through God, the, the surgeons that were working on me was in their hands and that, that the Lord was, was at the helm, that he was directing things. Then it was a huge relief sometime later when I woke up and when I realized I'm still here, I did come to find out that the surgery was more complicated than they had anticipated in the process of removing the tumor. They were able to get most of it, about 80 of the tumor was removed. In the process of removing what they did remove, it did damage my nerves. And so the right side of my face was paralyzed. I didn't really know what was going on. It was probably a few days before I started to grasp that I was alive, but that I had a whole new set of complications and side effects and a whole new battle to face. Over the next several days, as reality hit and we realized my face is paralyzed. And then we also realized that I had spinal fluid leaking out of my brain. It was actually dripping out of my nose and down the back of my throat. And whenever I would try to sit up, spinal fluid would drip out of my nose and out of my body. So it really feels like we just changed battles. So it just thrust us into a whole new reality. And that reality was a pretty scary one. And it was pretty overwhelming trying to balance gratitude for the fact that I was alive with finding the strength to now fight this new battle. It was a tenuous situation. And 
I just kept thinking, I just want to get back to normal. I just want to get back to normal. I want to see my kids. By the time my kids were able to come and see me, it had been a couple of days. They wanted me to be a little bit more stable. And when the kids came to the hospital, I'm sure it must have been hugely overwhelming for them. You know, half of my head was shaved. I was covered in staples and bandages. My eye was big and scary. My mouth was drooping. My face was different. It must have been a little disconcerting and frightening. When they walked in, my husband, you know, ushered the kids over and said, go give mom a hug. And some of them did. Some of them came right over immediately. But my little guy, who had just turned two, was afraid. He put his arms around his dad's leg and held on for dear life. And he did not want to come over and see me. And that was so painful because all I had wanted was to hug my littles. Whew, you know, it was, it was pretty heavy. And when they left, I just started to sob and to cry. And I thought, okay, we got to do things differently. My kids need to know that I'm mom and they need to be safe and they need to be comfortable in my presence. So immediately I started thinking of what can we do different next time so that it's a better experience. And I talked to the nurses and we made some preparations. And so the next time they came in, we had a, a patch that covered my eye so that my eye wasn't so scary. We made sure that bandages were covering everything on my head. I tried to talk to them. I tried to show them my, a little bit more of my personality and like, hey, it's still me. I still love you. Even though I looked so different, we did everything we could to make it more comfortable for them. Well, I loved your four-year-old in the book. Oh, he's the best. He was so cute. And I thought, what a sweetheart to just be so comfortable with mommy and all your new things. And he thoughts. ran right over to me and embraced me and looked at me and said, your eye is not closing. Do you want me to bring some tape so we could tape it? Like He was at the perfect age to be both honest and loving and accepting all at the same time. He's now almost 16. I don't know if that kid will ever understand the strength he gave me from the way that he treated me and his just total acceptance and love. Whew, that carried me a long way. I truly did cry through the whole book. <laughs> I was touched so much with so many things. Take us to the moment where you had your really darkest moment, because I think that was a beautiful moment and a miraculous moment. I think the darkest moment of the time that I was in the hospital was about three weeks in. I had had so many complications and side effects, and the spinal fluid leak was creating havoc in my body. Spinal fluid leaks can heal on their own. The body is amazing and Sometimes it can fix itself from these things, but mine was not healing on its own. And I had a lumbar drain, which is essentially like a epidural needle put into your back, but then it also pulled out fluid from my spine. And they were trying to see if that would help regulate the flow of my spinal fluid. It was incredibly painful. I wasn't able to sit up or get up because it would cause a spinal headache. And things had just been stacking on top of each other, one after another, after another, complication after complication. And I could feel my body just getting lower and lower and lower and being drained of not just spinal fluid, but of strength. And all the positivity just was fading, not because we didn't want to believe it anymore, but just because the reality of fighting that fight for so long when it was so painful and difficult started to feel very overwhelming and without knowing what was wrong i started to get sicker and sicker and sicker and the doctors believed at that time that there had to be something else that i was fighting that they thought spinal meningitis because all of these things were starting to happen in my body that didn't seem related to just the issue itself they shouldn't have been caused by just the tumor or just the spinal fluid leak or the facial paralysis, but other things were happening in my body. And I was getting weaker. And to me, honest to goodness, it felt like things were shutting down. So over the course of several days, I just got worse and worse and worse. And the doctors kept trying to figure it out, kept trying to figure it out. And they just kept giving me more and more medication prescriptions. They, I was on multiple antibiotics because they were trying to figure out what to do. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know how to handle it. They thought if it was spinal meningitis, 
that this triple antibiotic might help. So they were pumping more and more things into me. And yet all I could feel was all of the strength and all of the energy going out of me. And my dad had gone home to Hawaii for a couple of days. It's interesting because he flew in the day I had surgery. And of course, we only thought I was going to be in the hospital for a short period of time. And it had already been three plus weeks. And my brother was graduating from college. In fact, my mom was also graduating from college. So my dad flew home to Hawaii to be with my brother and to celebrate with my family. And my mom stayed with me and with Tolan in the hospital. Sunday, June the 7th, things were not going well. And my body was overwhelmed to the max. And as the day went on, I could just feel any remaining strength that I had seeping out that I had fought and fought and fought, but I just didn't have anything left in me. And that afternoon, we had gotten one little positive moment in the day when our friends in Hawaii had sent a big package, including a video that they had recorded of a whole bunch of friends and family members saying hello and aloha and sending us all of these treats. And there was very much a sense of peace and in that moment, I thought, okay, maybe things really are going to be okay. And that this peace that I feel is going to last. Instead, it seemed like almost as soon as that was over, the peace was gone. And I got worse and worse and worse and worse. And within a few hours of the early evening, it was clear that whatever was wrong was very, very serious. There was something inside of me that I knew these were my last hours on the earth it became very evident. And I think for the first time, my mom started to see it. And I remember that she stepped out of the room and called my dad. And at the time, you know, my dad was in Hawaii and my family was all there and they were trying to have the celebration and my sisters were there. I later found out that both of my sisters who were my best friends, they had both had dreams that I had passed away. And as they heard my mom deliver this message to my dad, everyone's fears kicked into high gear. And I remember my sister called and they handed the phone to me and she just said, Joe, you got to keep fighting. You know, your kids, they need you. We, your family, we need you. You got to promise me that you're going to keep fighting. And I remember thinking to myself, she doesn't know. And thinking that I could not make her that promise. It was out of my hands. So when she said that to me on the phone, I just said, I love you. <laughs> know that I love you. As the phone went from her to my dad and my dad said, I'm getting on a flight right now. I will see you in the morning. And in my mind, I thought, no, you won't. I won't be here when you get here. But I could not say that to my dad. So I just, again, I love you. Know that I love you. And got off the phone with them. And my mom was holding my hand and my husband was on the other side of the bed and things were just happening. Our, the room was a buzz. Everyone was trying to figure out what was happening. I think the doctors could tell that things were going in a very bad direction and they were desperately looking for answers. All of a sudden, it felt to me like the room got quieter, even though everything was still happening. And even though there was tons of people running in and out and the buzz was still there and it was going on, it was as though there had been a mute put on and everything in my mind just started to turn off. It was like I could just hear everything in my own body. And I was at one with my body and my spirit. And I could hear the shushings of the medication coming in and out of my veins. And I could hear my heartbeat. And I could feel the flow of my blood and the flow of my spinal fluid and all of these things. And there was this hyper attention to all of these little details. And I knew, okay, you have moments or minutes left. And I wondered, you know, I wonder what will shut down first. Will my heart stop? Will something happen in my brain? Like, I didn't know exactly how it would work. At that moment, Tolan was sitting next to me, holding my hand. And I just kept looking at him and I thought, he doesn't know we're at the end. But I did. And so on repeat, I love you. I love you. You need to know that I love you. I didn't want him to feel like I was giving up on our family. I didn't want him to feel like I wasn't fighting. And so while he was still holding my hand, I took what I truly believed would be my last breaths. As I exhaled and my eyes were closed, in my mind, I got to that place. It's totally up to you now, God. 
and I finally am willing to accept I am at peace with truly letting go. And as I exhaled those breaths and came to that conclusion in my mind, I had such a feeling of total and utter peace that I had done my part, that I had fought a good fight, that I had done everything and I wasn't leaving anything undone. And that I could be at peace when I left. And during that moment of peace or those moments, I felt a huge warmth as though some big arms were just like wrapping around me in a huge hug. And all of that strength and love and power you feel when someone bear hugs you and they just squeeze that love into you. That was what I felt in that moment. And I thought that that was kind of my welcome home. And instead, I felt that and I, I lived in it for some period of moments. And then when that hug was released or let go, I realized I was still in my body and I was still here. In that instant, I didn't feel that peace anymore. I felt pain and I felt sick, but I also felt the rush of everything in my body. And I wouldn't say that I felt like I was given a choice. You know, some people have had kind of a near-death experience and they said they felt like they had the opportunity to choose. I didn't feel like I had a choice. It wasn't like that for me. For me, it was as though I thought the choice was already made. I thought I had accepted. And in that moment, when I accepted, when I turned my will over and kind of said, okay, not my will be done, but thine. That was where the peace came from. And that was when I knew that that offering, that offering of my life that I was willing to give, that offering was accepted. And so in an instant, I was back in my body and I was there and I was still very, very sick, but I was there and I knew I needed to keep fighting. Shortly after that moment, my husband's grandfather arrived in town. He came directly from the airports and he gave me a blessing. They had a very, very powerful prayer in which he pleaded with God that I would live. And he felt very inspired in those moments to bless me and say, this night will be your lowest moments on earth. But from this time going forward, you will start to get better. Moments after that prayer ended, a resident came into the room and my husband was talking to him about some possibilities. And between the two of them, they had this idea to check for a condition called pneumocephalus. Pneumocephalus is a condition where you have air and gas on the brain. The idea was that because I had spinal fluid leaking out, that there was room for gas and air to get in that same hole and that that could have been causing the, the additional problems that I was having. So in moments, they wheeled me out of the room, they put me in a CT scan so that they could get images of my brain and could see that indeed that was the problem, that I had air on the brain that was creating this massive pressure that was pressing down on my brain and pushing up additional spinal fluid out and that that was literally what was killing me. Well, as soon as they knew what the problem was, then they knew how to fix it. The solution was actually quite simple, pure oxygen. So they rushed me back into the ICU. They put these oxygen masks on me and little by little, there again was not one thing that happened that just all of a sudden I was better. But after that night where I, I left and then came back, somehow we knew that things would continue and that we just had to keep going. As soon as I was strong enough the next day, they went in and had a specialty surgeon who had pioneered a brand new procedure that had only done been done three times before, totally experimental procedure. They brought him in and were able to seal the spinal fluid leak. This was the third surgical intervention that it had taken, but that was the one that finally sealed the leak. From there, it was a matter of one day at a time. There was kind of a, a I feel like a, a rush of strength that came into me from God over the next few days. And I did start to get that energy and I started to advocate for myself. I was ready to go home to my family. God had told me I was gonna be here. I knew I was gonna live and I was ready to and do it. And the number of blessings and, and miracles that happened during that time and having that experience, which I don't know if it, 
is technically called a near-death experience. It certainly felt like it to me, but the renewal of strength and energy that that gave me over the next long days and weeks to come was really what kept me going. And that was something that I desperately, desperately needed, that that hug I got from the other side kept the energy and the strength going in me when God knew that I would need it the most. And eight or nine days later, after that night, I got to go home. Things were still very, very, very hard, but I knew I was going to live and I knew I was good with God because he told me that in a very real and powerful, powerful way. That's amazing. I remember reading that moment in your book and just the miraculous experience of his loving power to revitalize you, to give you that strength, I think is amazing, truly. And the fact that God loves me, someone of no (laughs) real importance in the world, other than the fact that I am one of his children, has told me so much about the kind of God that we have. He loves each and every one of us to this extent, whether we have that opportunity to feel that hug or not at this time. And there's part of me that hopes that people don't have that because it means that you're pretty darn bad before you get there. But there's part of me that wishes everyone could have that overwhelming sense of love and power and hug and warmth and infusion of divine strength just being put into them. Yeah, that's powerful. I mean, it's a gift and I'm so happy for you and grateful that that you're here, that you've been able to raise your children and to be the mom that you always wanted to be this whole time. Like, can I please just be with my family? So I'm just, I love that, that you've been given the opportunity. Thank you so much. And I'm excited because it's going to be the five-year anniversary of my book coming out, which just blows my mind. I have had so many people ask questions along the way of some additional things kind of behind the scenes, things that didn't make it in the book. What are some other perspectives? And for this anniversary edition, I include some of that. My husband and I sat down and had a big interview and to what was it like from your end of things? But he has some amazing insight. And so there was going to be some bonus content at the end of the book because the reality was it wasn't just my experience, it was everyone's experience. And as I have come to see over the last decade, it really wasn't about a brain tumor at all. It's about God. And it's about God being able to show that he's still a God of miracles and that he still answers prayers. So I tried to go in and share some of these little extra things that we've experienced in the last couple of years so that all of you can see the continuing strength of God and continue to see his hand, not only in my life, but in the details of your own lives, because he shows up. We just have to choose to see it and recognize it for what it is. I totally agree. That's the purpose behind this podcast (laughs) is notice (laughs) where God shows up for you because he does. So tell us where we can find your book. And I'm excited to read the new edition. That's exciting. I am so excited for it too. You can always get the book on my website, which is Jody O. Brown, J-O-D-I-O Brown.com. Probably most people end up getting it through Amazon, Barnes and Noble. It's on any of the major book retailers. The title is The Sun Still Shines how a brain tumor helped me see the light. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's beautiful. You are truly an amazing person. And it was an honor to visit with you today and hear your story. Thank you so much. I hope you know that you are every bit and each one of us is every bit as wonderful and amazing. And we just have to embrace and find our own strengths and stories within so that we can move forward with God. Thank you so much for listening to this miracle story. Please subscribe to my channel.